Thank you all for attending. My name is Barry Ferguson. I'm a member of the History Department. But on behalf of the Canadian Studies Program, with uh, assistance from the University of Manitoba Institute for the Humanities and the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research, I'd like to welcome you and on your behalf to welcome Professor David E. Smith, who will speak today on the subject of the Senate of Canada. But just give me a minute, because I would like to introduce Professor Smith, if only for the YouTube uh, audience. And it's certainly a great pleasure to welcome him to the campus. David Smith has taught and written on Canadian politics for a number of years, for quite some time as a professor of politics at the University of Saskatchewan for a further period of years at the Saskatchewan Institute of Public Policy in Regina, and currently as a distinguished visitor at Ryerson University, to which he commutes from his home at New Home at Niagara on the Lake, Ontario. Professor Smith's work on the Senate provides us with the perspective and insight to understand the exciting ephemera of the current Senate Privy Council Office scandal the ominous federal measures and continuing court referrals to reform the Senate via statute, not constitutional change, and the now, as I count it, 50-year grind to reform, revise, and possibly triple EIs the Senate. Hmm. Professor Smith, more generally, has clarified the historical, constitutional, and political roles of the Senate in articles in one major book, The Canadian Senate in Bicameral Perspective, available at this moment in our bookstore. He has written, by my count, five major works on federal political institutions, including, most recently, Across the Isle, Opposition in Canadian Politics, available in our bookstore. He has written several other books, including three that are crucial for understanding the rise and fall of the Liberal Party, on the prairies, one of them a biography of Saskatchewan Premier and Liberal Cabinet Minister of days of old James G. Gardner. His writing, finally, combines the political scientist's attention to governmental and political institutions with a historian's attention to not just chronology but the contexts of political development. And that makes his work most attractive to us all, I hope. Please welcome David Smith. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be in Winnipeg. I haven't been here for some time. I didn't know there was so much snow in Canada. <laughs> it seems to be here. But I'm sure it'll go. So I've been asked to talk about the Senate, and I will read my remarks. Round and round goes the circle of epithets. The Senate is illegitimate, it's undemocratic, it's unrepresentative. The reply to the question, what is to be done about the upper chamber, is never an answer, but an assertion. Make it representative, make it legitimate, make it democratic. Hardly ever is a response to ask another question, what kind of Senate should Canada have? It is the never-ending repetition of democratic or other first principles that makes the discussion of Senate reform frustrating and unprofitable. It goes nowhere and has gone nowhere. Once again, it is in the hands of the Supreme Court of Canada, and the outcome of that reference seems, I think, fairly clear, at least if the court goes with the same route as the Quebec Court of Appeal last October. Here is a, her a heretical thought. Is it possible that Canadians are a unicameral people, that they do not like second chambers? There is a disposition toward unicameralism. Uh, if you think of the Clarity Act, which requires only action of the House of Commons and not of the Senate, uh, if that event ever arises with regard to a, a plebiscite of uh, secession. Is this yet another demonstration of Harold Innes's dictum that, quote, in Canada, our natural tendency is to lean toward concentration? If this inclination is true, that is, that unicameralism is Canada's natural condition, it would help explain the pattern of talk 
but no action on representational matters, for instance, reform of the Senate or of the electoral system, both of which were excised 25 years ago from the terms of reference of the Lord T. Commission on Electoral Reform and Party Finance. It's not enough to say, as is often said, that an appointed Senate is an affront to Canadian democracy and ergo its members must necessarily be elected. Or again that the upper chamber has been since Confederation a preserve, a partisan preserve of patronage, the beneficiaries of which make but minimal contribution to public well-being and therefore it should be abolished. This is not to say that arguments for an elected chamber or for abolition of the chamber may not be made, of course they may, but rather that unless these arguments are advanced in a logical, coherent fashion, they will fail, as all attempts at reform have failed, except the introduction in 1965 of a retirement age of 75 for senators versus appointment for life, as the Constitution originally provided. And that reform, introduced before the current amending formula was in place, was initiated by John Diefenbaker, then Prime Minister, and after the Liberal-dominated Senate thwarted Mr. Diefenbaker's attempt to peremptorily remove James Coyne from his position as Governor of the Bank of Canada. The Senate insisted instead that Mr. Coyne be permitted to explain the bank's so-called tight monetary policy, which was not the government's, before a Senate committee, having his day in court, one might say, Following this ter testimony, but still in the halls of Parliament, Mr. Coyne announced his resignation. Why has Senate reform proved so difficult to achieve? Before answering that question, it may be useful to provide some factual background that must, in the interest of time, be telescoped. First, as just noted, senators hold their positions until age 75. Second, there is a fixed number of senators, 24 per senatorial division, of which there are four, plus nine add-ons, six for Newfoundland, one each for the territories. Two divisions are single provinces, the other divisions have three and four provinces, respectively. A consequence of this limitation is that the Senate is less than one-third the size of the Commons, almost intimate in atmosphere. Third, to repeat, the number is fixed and is extremely difficult to add extra senators, a feat done only once by Brian Mulroney at the time of the impasse over the GST. And fourth and last feature is that senators are appointed on recommendation of the Prime Minister by the Governor General. Legislation currently before the Supreme Court in the form of a reference question would, if found constitutional, institute nine-year non-renewable terms instead of appointment until age 75. As well, it provides for consultative elections carried out in the provinces to determine nominees to play B, whose names would then be placed before the Governor General. In October, the Court of Appeal in Quebec found this proposed legislation unconstitutional, achievable only by amendment to the Constitution. Why do the Fathers of Confederation decide upon these particular features for the Senate? This is not a trivial question, since the Fathers of Confederation spent more time in Quebec on the composition of the Senate than they did on any other section of what has come to be known as the Constitution Act. More than that, the Senate was the one institution purposely designed to serve the new Dominion of Canada. In structure and operation, the House of Commons was an imitation of the Commons of Westminster, while the Crown, the third part of Parliament, was assimilated totally into the new Constitution. The 20 words of Section 9 of the Constitution Act say, quote, the executive government authority of and over Canada is hereby declared to continue and be vested in the Queen, end quote. In the matter of senators, it is the Queen's representative, the Governor General, who makes the appointment in the Queen's name. To my mind, Section 9 is so absolute as to defy circumvention by simple statute. Constitutional monarchy makes explicable, if not acceptable to some, appointment of senators by the Crown on the advice of the Prime Minister. There's no need to rehearse the arguments against an appointed upper house, they are well known. What can be said is that constitutional monarchy offered the Fathers of Confederation a practicable method of selecting senators to the upper house at a time when there were few alternatives. 
election was not popular in the United Canada after the experiment initiated in the 1850s and the elected upper house, while selection by provincial legislatures of delegates from among their numbers to sit at the center, as was done in 19th century United States, violated the common sense of parliament as a supreme legislative power, as in the United Kingdom, and the belief that the British North Americans held that the creation of a national parliament marked an important step for the constitutional maturity. According to Bruno, the only example, writing at the beginning of the 20th century, the only example in the 19th century of unicameral polities were the republics of Central America, the Balkan states, and the land tags and diets of the Austrian and German empires. Membership in the upper chamber by, is by senatorial region. The guarantee of equal regional but not provincial representation with the more populous provinces of Ontario and Quebec was responsible for the entry of the maritime colonies. Regional equity was essential to, in, to concluding the Confederation bargain, said George Brown. It might be thought, he added, <coughs> that Nova Scotia and New Brunswick got more than their share in the originally adopted distribution. But it must be recollected that they had been independent provinces, and the count of heads must always be permitted to outweigh every other consideration." End quote. And in Canadian politics, I think it is, as a general rule, safe to say that we don't, never count, we weigh. Uh, considerations when it comes to making decisions. The Senate was a form of negotiated compensation for securing rep by paw in the House of Commons. Compensation to Quebec for what it had lost, equal representation in the Parliament of United Canada, and compensation for the Maritimes for what they would gain. In consequence of that agreement, it was possible to view British North America in the words of Christopher Duncan, minister in charge of the very first census, as the three kingdoms. The allusion was to the United Kingdom, which encompassed England, Scotland, and Ireland, along with the Principality of Wales, and notwithstanding whose diversity appeared to the Fathers of Confederation the paradigm of a successful nation. What was missing in the analogy, however, was federalism. Although Canada was a federal union, its politicians said amazingly little about this feature of the Constitution except to haggle over the division of powers. The Macdonald government had no vision as to how the Federation would expand, and thus was left to react to Riel's multiple demands following the rebellion of Red River. David Mills, liberal journalist and later cabinet minister, charged the Conservatives with failing, quote, to do what the theory of their system required, end quote. A criticism borne out when introducing the Manitoba Act of 1870, the Prime Minister told the House that, quote, it was not of great importance whether the province was called a province or a territory. We have provinces of all sizes and shapes and constitutions, so that there could not be anything determined by the use of the word. This failure to determine, to think through the imperative of federalism, that is, how to expand territory but not jeopardize the terms of the original agreement has proved a major failure of the Canadian political system. Unlike the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 passed by the Congress established under the Articles of Confederation of the United States and which set the terms of admission to the American Union, no such formula ever existed in Canada. All conditions of entry were subject to negotiation. The precedent was set with the creation of Manitoba by federal statute in 1870 following the rebellion. The causes of that rebellion were to be found in events associated with the transfer of Rubert's land and Northwestern territories to the Crown in right of Canada earlier that year, by which action Canada quadrupled in size. Or in the poetic words of Lord Dufferin, Canada's third Governor General, paying the first vice regal visit west of the shield, quote, it is here in Manitoba that Canada learned that her historical territories were but the vestibules and antechambers to that still of undreamed of dominion. The disequilibrium caused by the acquisition of the West has never been righted, at least not in the eyes of the West. 
although attempts to assure the maritime provinces that they would not be overwhelmed <coughs> by the new provinces with large settler populations led unexpectedly to political guarantees that made reform of the Senate all but impossible to achieve. <coughs> Debate over what became the Constitution Act 1915, which created the fourth western section, senatorial division, prompted maritime disquiet at its prospects in Confederation compared to those of the booming West. A sample of that unease may be found in a memorandum on representation of the maritime provinces from 1914. Quote, each colony has a right to adequate representation, italicized. A self-governing colony is more than the number of its inhabitants, end quote. Decades later, the Supreme Court of Canada used the same rationale in the Saskatchewan redistribution case, not equality of voting power per se, but, quote, the right to effective representation was the standard to be sought in the exercise of redistribution. But the Constitution Act 1915 went further than the maritime provinces had requested. No province, it said, was to have fewer members than it had senators. And the Constitution Act 1982, Section 41, made this guarantee one of four <coughs> specified matters requiring unanimous consent for their amendment. The others were alterations to the Office of Queen, Governor General, or Lieutenant Governor, the composition of the Supreme Court of Canada, and the use of English and French languages, and the fourth being the senatorial guarantee. Thus was created a Herculean obstacle to any Senate reform touching the subject of membership numbers. If, for the sake of argument, the Senate were to be abolished under a 750 provision, what would happen to the guarantee in Section 41? Possession of the territory west of the Great Lakes increased the power of the federal government vis-a-vis -vis the frontier. As a consequence, control, not freedom, as in the United States, predominated. In the words of Northrop Frye, a singular feature of Canada was its longitudinal mentality. An example would be the Northwest Mounted Police, created in 1873, and according to Richard Gwynn in his second volume of, of MacDonald, the first ever distinctly Canadian institution, a police force. The statutes of Parliament that created Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta retained for the purposes of the Dominion the new province's natural resources and kept them, as you know, until 1930. They imposed denominational schools as a constitutional right, and they conferred on the Canadian Pacific Railway in perpetuity a number of land and tax privileges. There is a large literature on the West sense of grievance, and its causes are more numerous than the matters I've just mentioned although these charges are among the most prominent. Nor are the complaints ancient history. The national energy policy of 30 years ago surely ranks high on the bill of indictment. Much more could be said, but not here or now, about the West's sense of domination and exploitation by the populist East. Here, in large part, is the explanation for the West's tradition of protest parties in federal and provincial politics. For example, the progressives, social credit, the CCF NDP. But the strategy of political parties is a strategy that involves elected chambers. The Senate, of course, is not elected. It is appointed on recommendation of the Prime Minister. With one or two exceptions, Canadian Prime Ministers have not recommended as Senators individuals from protest parties. Enter the Reform Party, its critique of federal politics, and a two-decade-old campaign, ultimately unsuccessful, to make the Senate triple E equal, elected, and effective. It is frequently said that reform of the Senate is a perennial topic in Canadian politics. While it is true that proposals to change the Senate may be found over the decades after Confederation, these were never more than ad hoc or passing phenomena. Triple E constituted a multifaceted campaign, one that involved the media, academics, and sustained public, but at the beginning, non-governmental endorsement and support. It brought the Senate into the focus of institutional change. 
While it's true that the Senate had regularly been the subject of study during constitutional discussions in the 70s and 80s, none of those <coughs> proposals ever matured as Triple E did. Having said that, it needs to be noted that the Trudeau government's constitutional reform package of 1978 provided for a House of the Provinces in place of the Senate with members indirectly elected by provincial legislative assemblies and by the House of Commons. That proposal, just like Mr. Harper's now, was submitted to the Supreme Court of Canada in 1980 for an opinion on its constitutionality. In reply, the court said first that, quote, it is clear that the intention of the Fathers of Confederation was to make the Senate a thoroughly independent body which could canvass dispassionately the measures of the House of Commons, end quote. Further, it stated that, quote, the Senate has a vital role as an institution forming part of the federal system. Thus, the body, which has been created as a means of protecting sectional and provincial interests, was made a part participant in the legislative process, end quote. That's all from the Supreme Court opinion of 1980. Thoroughly independent, an institution forming part of the federal system, a participant in the legislative process. These phrases have come to severely test proposals for Senate reform. At the same time, the advisory opinion made clear that the Senate was already a part of the federal system and an actor in the legislative process. Subsequent to 1980, schemes to alter the upper chamber in a manner that might be said to weaken these judicially ascribed characteristics have encountered informed opposition from the outset. For instance, does an emphasis upon representation undermine the dispassionate contemplative role and vision for the Senate? And again, are senatorial terms compatible with thorough independence? In the last quarter century, a sense of constitutionalism, and with it an element of abstraction, has emerged that tends to distance proposed reforms of the objects sought. And this includes even Mr. Harper's so-called minimalist reforms before the Supreme Court of Canada at the present moment. There is another feature of the Senate in the Canadian Constitution that warrants comment. Canada is unique among federations in the world in that while its federal parliament is bicameral, its provincial legislatures are not. Five of the provinces once had upper chambers. Quebec was the last province to abolish its legislative council in 1968. Ontario, the three westernmost provinces, and Newfoundland and Labrador since it became a province, have been unicameral. Such asymmetry is unusual, <coughs> unexpected, but not unimportant in the context of this discussion. Why was a province such as Ontario, which traditionally has made a virtue out of its British heritage and loyalty, satisfied with a single chamber when the mother of parliaments had two? The answer is that Ontario and the other provinces understood the Senate's role to be a protector of religious, racial, and linguistic minorities. There was no need for local upper houses. Quebec was different because following the introduction of representative government in 1791, its large English-speaking Protestant minority had looked to the colony's upper house for protection. While Manitoba was a temporary exception because its early dualistic constitution reflected the terms that Riel had demanded from Ottawa. Nonetheless, the first sentence of the Constitution Act, 1867, states that Canada shall have, quote, a constitution similar in principle to that of the United Kingdom. In that constitution, supreme legislative authority resides in two chambers. But the analogy with Great Britain and its parliament is false, for there never was a time when the upper chamber in Canada held dominance in the British North America 
The achievement of responsible government was an accomplishment of the lower chamber under the command of Baldwin and Lafontaine and against the Legislative Council and the government. The removal of placemen, that is, appointees of the crown, and the introduction of patronage subjected the executive to the control of Parliament. The Senate never had the authority of the House of Lords. No landed aristocracy, no established church, no personal tie to sovereign. There was never a crisis in Canada such as 1910 in Britain on the Parliament Act. Federalism and responsible government are the two principal features of Canadian politics. The Senate has a role in neither. Canadians are a unicameral people. In the absence of immediate experience with bicameralism, they have no appreciation for legislative institutions that are not representative bodies. In these matters, they lack both sense and sensibility, a condition reinforced when the subject is the protect protection of rights by the rise of the more popular competitor, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. As a legislative body, which is the Senate's primary role, the upper chamber is seldom criticized. As a representative body, which is not its primary or even secondary role, it is frequently criticized. What is to be done? The Minister of State responsible for democratic reform, Pierre Colbert, has said that two democratically elected chambers would be ideal for the Canadian public. The Premier of Saskatchewan, a former student, I might say, of mine, and I'm disappointed in his opinion, Brad Wall has called for abolition of the Senate because of its reform is, is impossible to achieve. While well, Burke Brown, one of only two indirectly elected senators to date, has asked, you want a, a dictatorship in this country? Without the Senate, however constituted, the Prime Minister would have absolute power. A maze of compromises, deals, and agreements, the Senate's architecture is central to the conundrum of its reform. Central but inadequately acknowledged, since debate seldom strays from the tried and true. Should the Senate be appointed or elected? In either case, should this be done at the center, nationally, or in the parts, provincially? Should the tenure of senators be limited to terms of whatever length, as opposed to a mandatory retirement age? When it comes to function, should the Senate be limited to a delaying or a suspensive veto, like its Westminster counterpart, or should there be weighted voting for measures in specific, specified categories, for example, federal spending? Or should there be a double majority voting on measures of special linguistic significance? Or should the Senate be given power to approve order and council appointments as well as consent to treaties? Proposed reforms come and go and come again, but always with the same outcome, no change. Why is institutional and constitutional change in the matter of Canada's second chamber, whether major in the form of Charlottetown, incremental in the form of Mr. Harper's the government's proposal is so difficult to achieve. Part of the explanation, I believe, lies in the longevity of senators. Appointed for life until 1965, until age 75 since. Although that provision may lead to extraordinary long tenure, generally it does not. I uh, contrary to what the public might think. The average length of the office is, well, well, uh, some years ago when I looked at this, was around 12, but it's in, it's in the teens anyway. They're not there, and some even retire before 75, it's actually no one. Still, this is far longer, which is the important point, than the career of most MPs, and more particularly, of cabinet ministers who pilot reform through Parliament. The life of cabinet ministers is very short indeed in their particular portfolio. Nor is it immaterial that senators are at the end of their political careers. There is no political uncertainty or calculation as to their tenure. Time is on their side. Part of it lies, the explanation for no, no change, lies in the composition of the Senate, where despite specified senatorial divisions, senators are allocated among the provinces. In the eyes of each province, their senators, or better still, their number of senators, belongs to them. Proposed reforms that would affect the numbers or the function of senators are carefully scrutinized by the provinces. Thus, the Senate never stands alone. The Senate has allies who, regardless of party complexion, usually come to its aid. 
And part of the explanation lies in the unity of the crown in Parliament and the theory that sustains it, that there is no constituent power outside that tripartite institution. This acts as an original and powerful disincentive to articulating and initiating reform of the Senate, and then carrying it through to a successful conclusion. Back in 2007, former Senator uh, Dan Hayes said that the Senate of Canada should emulate the United Kingdom example and encourage the government of the day to appoint a royal commission on Senate reform. I did not agree with that idea at the time he made it. I think I do now. Not because a royal commission in itself will produce a second chamber drawing broad public consensus. That seems improbable. Rather, I support a royal commission with terms of reference that will promote thought about Canada's, sorry, about Canada's uh, central political institutions. Other than the role of the Senate, among the subjects it might address would be matters touching the work of the House of Commons, for example, questions of representation such as the electoral system, electoral administration, election law, and voter turnout, along with much complaint of rigidities in the conduct of commons of business and procedure. The third part of Parliament is the Crown, and a Royal Commission could with advantage examine, and perhaps even propose, codification of such prerogative powers as those dealing with Parliament's prorogation and dissolution. That appointment of Senators is not the sole or even major source of Canada's frequently cited democratic deficit should be readily acknowledged. To the extent that admission is made, that admission is made, then the source of the conundrum of Senate reforms become clearer. Indictments about representation and legitimacy are not upper house matters alone, but plague all of Parliament. In other words, the interrelationship of Parliament's parts is a major contributing factor to the conundrum of Senate reforms. <coughs> Thank you.